when we got here to this week of the MDI, there were some clear favorites. But these two teams have proven that they are the best in the European region, and they have both secured their spot in that global land, the first ever land in MDI history. And now we got to pit these two Titans against each other and see who the best is, who is going to take first place, who is going to get the king share of that prize pool. We find out starting right now, and I get to host that series. My name is Rich Campbell and our two casters, we got Jack and we got Sloot. Guys, I'm really, really excited for this one, and it is actually going to be a rematch. These two teams have already played against each other a little bit earlier on. They've looked dominant pretty much throughout the entire weekend. Now, Jack, start with you. What can we expect now that we already have a little bit under our belt? We know what PogChamp and Shell's Angels really do like to do. And it really, it's just been the big trash density pulls that show, uh, that Team PogChamp has really been showing its colors at, and even, you know, especially how well they've been playing in seat and being able to, you know, overtake, like you said, getting that rematch going, overtaking Shell's Angels in the winner's bracket there. And I think a lot of it is also going to be the pressure is going to be off a lot of these teams because they both have qualified, like you said, for the LAN. So at this point, you know, it's definitely going to be the big prize money incentive that they'll be able to bring home a lot more money even before they go to the LAN. But at this time, I think a lot of pressure is off the shoulders. And seeding. But let's take a look at the map pool because when we talk about PogChamp Salute, one of the big things was this diverse comp that they have. They have a lot of different tools and that helped them a lot in the previous map pool. But taking a look right now, these are the maps that we will see in this final round. I mean, that's the thing, you know, the advantage that they had with that mage and that warlock just doesn't really exist here as much. We don't have the black rick hold. We don't have access to Arcway, so it's just going to come down to a lot less cheesiness, <laughs> as we've spoken <laughs> about before, and those huge advantages that this comp has. I mean, you know, this is, of course, assuming that they run that mage warlock when walker comp, which I, I mean, they've stuck true to for the entire tournament, so we're going to see that coming from them, but I mean, this is just a rematch right now on seat, but this time bumped up a notch, and we saw both teams struggle at least the first round through before they had to do that replay with the trash right before viceroy so add another and i mean we know these dungeons scale exponentially so the difference between a 23 and a 24 much bigger than a 22 to a 23 they're gonna have to play it pretty carefully this is a tough one on live too i i think that's like a thing to note and we we actually before the mdi even started we were watching some of the best teams in the world actually get to play in, in quite a few of these and a lot of people that you and i have gotten to run with you more than me run, run these dungeons on a high difficulty and see how hard even on live that they really can be seats not an easy one but we do have to think about that map pool as a whole I, I feel like PogChamp most likely is going to run that composition even when it doesn't have some of those those cheesy things if you will those weird class identity things that are really cool to watch it's a strong comp for the most part. I, th I think we're just starting to lean back to, as, as the guys and the gal were discussing in the last series, that, you know, we're starting to get to these higher dungeons that are a lot more dangerous. There's a lot more on the line. Yeah, we're past that breathing space now, but there's still a lot of money on the line. There's seating on the line. There's pride on the line for some of these teams. So we're going to see perhaps them going back into comfort picks, which... PogChamp is already at right now. This is what they've been playing the entire tournament, so I totally agree with you. We'll probably just see the exact same thing from them. Shaw's Angels, they might swap it up a bit from that two-win walker, one boomkin comp. Yeah, one of the scariest things as you're going to see the Triumvirate is how lethal those things, uh, how lethal the instance really is to melee. You know, there's so many different void zones that are going to be all over the place, and a lot of times you will see that, you know, you're having the Viceroy room, like you mentioned, is just so, so dangerous for, you know, both teams, and if they're not careful, it will really just uh, wreck their times. Well, to, to balance off of that as well, we already kind of have seen I mean, Shell's Angels be a team that is good at adapting, right? We have seen them actually break out different compositions. We, we've seen them go full full monk before. We've seen them switch it up, play two. We've seen them play the Boonkin. We've seen them play Rogue. But now let's take a look at the bracket and just get that refresher. Now that we are in that final matchup, let's see how these teams got there. They had to take down some very, very tough opponents to get here. I mean, look, Shell's Angels, they exit from that lower portion of the bracket. They sent one of the favorites for the tournament back packing straight to stay at home. But the thing is, is PogChamp has been on a remarkable run. They have yet to lose a single series jack in this tournament. And that's one of the biggest surprises, I think, of this tournament, of, you know, seeing the number one and two seeds really getting knocked out. Uh, you know, Team Infinite and, of course, uh, Method losing right there. And this is one of the the tournaments that has, has had the most competition that we've ever really seen. You know, so many different dungeons getting very, very close together. And when you see, I believe it was like the second through fifth or sixth seed of Europe was all within a minute or so of each other. You know, it really speaks to how competitive it is, not just in the time trials, but now we're seeing going forward, you know, one death here, one death there, just absolutely deciding keys. It's so insane how tough the competition has been in the European region, but let's see what these two teams got for us. We're ready to jump into seat. It is a rematch 
but this one is for a lot of pride. It is for seeding at the global final that these two teams have qualified for. And hey, while we're at it, let's try to get a little bit of extra money up in that purse. Boys, let's jump into the seat. All right. Ah, you're not Nagura. Jack. <laughs> Good to see you again. Hello. <laughs> Same pull right off the bat that we saw in the seat earlier. Well, you saw from the back room, of course, in the seat earlier. We're just going to have that mass AOE grip. It looks like they actually missed a couple of the mobs with that AOE grip, but they do funnel in nonetheless. 14 Pog Champ on the left. Bloodless pulled... Uh, pu pulled off from both teams right off the bat, whereas in the 23 series between them, we saw them actually wait for the boss with it. Yeah, at this point, you know, like you said earlier, you know, the exponential scaling of the dungeons really does put a lot more pressure on using Bloodlust early, on being able to deal with these mobs much earlier, and it takes, you know, quite a bit longer to be able to get all of them down. You're seeing Ting Pog Champ just resetting the boss there. That way they're going to be able to take out a bunch of the oozes. You are seeing one death going out there onto Seer, uh, the Holy Pally for Shell's Angels, and, you know, it is extremely lethal. You actually had a close-up, for example, of uh, Elrat or Elzrat on... Uh, uh, Pogchamp just being able to bubble himself staying safe in melee because there does come a point really where you're in there in melee long enough and you're just not able to get out and you just instantly die. Now we're seeing it, Shell's Angels here actually opting to play more defensively compared to the 23 that we saw them run earlier where they actually pulled these goos with Zurat, the first boss. This time they're just kind of dealing with it just like Team Pogchamp did before, opting to kind of just kite them around, make sure the tank doesn't get too many stacks, free up that space that they will need for this 24 boss. Now we are in a fortified setting so it kind of makes sense because of that scaling that they popped that Bloodlust early making sure to kill everything. Well, frankly, before the tank dies, we know how devastating that Dark Withering damage could be. Uh, of course, uh, they're all sitting there waiting for the players to pull. Now, what we saw from these two teams earlier was that Team Pogchan output a substantial more amount of single target burst during the vulnerability phase on this boss. We're going to have to see if it follows suit here as they have switched to that rogue from the second Windwalker of on Shell's Angels, which will help them with a survivability, of course, as well, Jack. And that's one thing they're really going to be needing throughout this instance. You know, like I said, they're running with the Boomkin, they're running with the rogue here. You know, they, they definitely have to have it in their minds of how squishy some of the monks can be uh, compared to, you know, the, the switches and the counterparts, of course, that they pulled into this. But like you said, you know, a lot of it's going to be on that single target damage. We've seen in the past where, you know, keeping up the extra uh, blobs that will spawn from Zoral after his first decimate do go out can be extremely helpful for just pumping out more and more damage early on in the fight. So, and especially when we get into that vulnerability phase. So those are all right now at about the same percentage for the teams. Team Pogchamp just slightly behind. A lot of that big damage did end up coming from the Warlock, which we're seeing the teams not killing too many of those ooey gooey rich and chewies right away because he can get that extra damage from the multi-dot and especially getting that banish in if he's wearing Cephas, which I presume he is. If he's wearing Cephas during that burn phase, we do see the Monk Muscle Bra go down on Team Pogchamp right now, getting those 10 kills right away. Getting really low there, though. Nobody's downstairs to heal him right now. So he's got to be careful, especially with that quaking damage on top of it. The Rogue downstairs for the other team should be coming up in just a moment and they're or, uh, excuse me they've already started their burn phase on shells angels should be finishing it momentarily the boss health just melting down as team pogchamp starts theirs in the meantime we'll have to keep an eye on where these percents end up 36 percent for shells angels and we'll have to see where zoral ends up for team pogchamp at the end of their burn yeah they have a couple seconds left for their burn and like you're saying you know sj was keeping up all of the, the uh the ooey gooeys as you were putting it as Rich long as they possibly could Rich, Rich and Chewies I apologize and they were about the same percent uh, at the end of the burn phase as Shell's Angels there so it's pretty equal damage going out over that period of time and it's, like I said it's very important to be able to watch how well they're going to be able to manage these ads I mean we were seeing a, you know, it'll always stand out to be with Skyline D having all of the gooeys right next to the boss during that vulnerability phase to have their double rogues be able to pump out a lot of damage so having good uh, good ad control here is just so key as of course you're seeing their all their tanks are moving to the edges of the room to be able to drop those decimates yeah so a a lot of health left on this boss. We do know that this boss has a really large health pool, similar to the last boss, Lura, as we get to the end of the dungeon because of that mechanic with the increased damage. Now, Team Pogchamp did get to about 32% at the end of their burn, so slightly in favor of damage for them during that burst, but both teams kind of running a bit out of real estate here. We'll definitely have to visit a second burn phase as we see Dr. J, the mage on Team Pogchamp, going down for his transitional phase, and we do have a death over on Shell's Angels right now as well. You've seen Muscle Bra going down uh, as also for Team Pogchamp. Champ. So you have those equal deaths going out due to the fixate. They're kind of just running out of that real, real estate. They really need to see uh, somebody about getting in more of that. And Pogchamp here just burning down the last of uh, Zoral, getting getting everybody back up, getting everybody back into position here. I, and overall, pretty equal. I like seeing from both teams not using that battle res either. The boss was low enough. They were just about to enter that burn phase and finish it off right there. So well done by both of them. They will start the RP now, and I expect, as we do see right now, both teams to pull some of the trash along with that RP to make sure they're making efficient use of their time as Shell's Angels pulls that pack on the side, starts kiting it into the building, and Team Pogchamp will be following suit, or maybe they're not following suit. Oh, they've already killed it, actually. They're moving into the building now. Yep, and they're wasting no time to be able to get those extra mobs down, so at this point, you know, they're just kind of waiting around for the gates to start opening up here. And as you said, you know, it's 
we do have to keep in mind it is fortified, quaking, and explosive here. You know, we saw in the very early polls just how well for instance, the Paladin and the Blood Decay were able, for both sides, were able to deal with a lot of these explosives here. And it really will stand out, especially as we're going on to, like, Sappers here. You know, you'd be looking at, like, the Warlock, or you'd be looking at the Boomy to uh, help on some of those areas when a lot of times you'll see uh, the explosives on Sappers kind of sitting in the middle of all those little traps there. So always one thing to watch out for is when you're having to switch from, you know, your ranged DPS or your melee players or your tank or your healer, switching to the ranged players to get some some things that your uh, other two cannot. Alaria coming in like a wrecking ball there and opening up the wall for both teams <laughs> as they start this kind of gauntlet event where they have to kill three Rift Wardens. After doing that, they'll have access to Sappers, the second boss. Only one Rift will spawn at a time, but they do spawn in set locations. The first one, of course, being here where, that we see in front of us afterwards. It'll be to the right of the camera, well, the right of the Team Pog Jam's camera in this case. And they need to get to it quickly, Jack, about 15 to 20 seconds. Otherwise, there will be small adds that constantly spawn on top of them, doing a bit of splash damage and just really slowing them down. So after this first Rift Warden's then I do expect both teams to hurry along to the second Rift Warden, as we saw in their 23 maps as well. But the trash being much more dangerous now. And you've seen Shell's Angels wasting no time and help it clear out some of the trash that they eventually need to be going towards there. While, you know, Team Pogchamp on the other side of it is actually just moving right through, cutting through the gap, pulling a lot of the ads into it off to the side there. You are seeing a quick lay on hands going out onto the uh, to, to Divine Field there. Make sure you're keeping them up because that's also one of the other dangers. When you're pulling a lot of those extra uh, GUIs on top of, you know, for example, the Rift Warden there, you're really extending, you know, the lifetime of, you know, all those GUIs. You have to be dealing with the Rift Warden first and there's so much dot damage that stacks up really quickly there and you're even seeing uh, Purgatory Proc from early on. Yeah, and Muscle Bra dipping lower than my GPA in university there as they pull the second warden over. Immediate LOH goes out on Muscle Bra. Actually, I'm not sure if they LOH'd or uh, I think it was an LOH because he went from 8% right up to 100, saving Muscle That's Bra. That yeah, that, that is how that works. Uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> not enough for the Paladin to save themselves. Elsrat does go down, immediately gets res. Their battle res has been used now. Muscle Bra goes down as well. Has no choice but to release Shelly going down as well. The Warlock on Team Pogchamp. Things are looking not Pogchamp over on the left side. Shell's Angel is really stable, but uh, Sarah Lou getting so low as well. The Holy Pattern manages to heal himself back up and stabilize the situation, but they got a lot of trash there, Jack. They have so much trash, and they all have to be dealing with the different suppression fields here, so their ability to be able to move and dodge a lot of the traps on the ground, a lot of, you know, the extra void zones that are going to be spawning constantly here are so, so dangerous, and Divine Fields really got to be watching out to be able to keep on kiting through out here and helping out with the explosives whenever you can. Muscle Bra also dropping so low right now, having to deal again with that suppression field. You know, the Paladin is able to, of course, use your Blessing of Freedom, but they can only use it so often, so he again, he, you know, puts it right onto Muscle Bra, so he's able to keep on moving, keep on escaping those void zones there as the only melee. You're seeing, you know, the Paladin kind of backing off when uh, more of those debuffs start going out. Ashin's health getting so low there as well, didn't have that cheat death available. Purgatory already progged for Divine Field over on Shell's Angel side. They're just working as hard as they can to clean up the rest of the trash. Finally managed to get rid of the rest of it. No deaths incurred, no extra deaths incurred on Shell's side, but three on Team Pog Champs as they already start moving over as well. We do have some of those tricksters coming up, trick or treating right now. They will be running around the side here, all the way over to the final Rift Warden, as we can see in the distance. Now, they do have to park a bit here. There's a good chance they will get some of that gauntlet trash spawning on top of them as they try to grab some of this trash and efficiently pull it over to the Warden. Shell's Angels doing the same thing as the Boomkin runs over to tag that Warden right away before the gauntlet starts. And I love what you're seeing in Elzrad. He's actually just following behind, you know, uh, uh, Cell's defense, or sorry, uh, you know, his advance there, making sure he's taking care of all of the extra orbs in, uh, in Seb's path there. And it makes it so much easier when you're able to rely on, you know, how you're doing these pulls, having that extra practice to make sure that you're saying, okay, you know, when you're running ahead, I'm always going to follow. I'll take care of this. The rest of the DPS follow up, just start dealing damage, get all the trash down. SJ is going down once more. They, need him in, they don't have any battle reses left available, so he has to release on this one. And they still have not yet made it to the Rift Warden. They're getting it right now. And this is one of the hard parts when you're having to deal with this Rift Warden is all the other trash that's surrounding your area and trying to make sure you're getting the Rift Warden out far enough that it's not going to be intersecting with any of the paths of the patrols. Right, you are, Jack. Shell's Angel's looking a bit more stable, a bit more dominant in the second boss's area after the first boss. Of course, they have the two of those versus the one on Team Pogchamp. But Pogchamp, a bit rattled in this area, having a few splash deaths, not uncommon to what we saw in their 23 map, of course, add a few percentages on top of all that with this 24, and you're getting a lot of spilled deaths over on the, I believe there's actually been two apiece for the Warlock, I know, the Warlock, two on the Warlock, one on the Windwalker, and of course, one on the Holy Paladin. They are working off to finish this last Rift Warden as Shell's Angels already does that. If the previous maps were of any information, they will be doing a large pull here in front of Saprish, and then getting ready to get on that second boss. And hey, you've seen Shell's Angels here opening up a lot more of that real estate. They have a great realtor uh, to be available to them. You know, clearing out a lot of the areas by those portals. <laughs>
<laughs> Take it easy, buddy. And uh, and this is what you really need in terms of the room. You will just start running out of room so rapidly with all the traps that are going down, having to avoid the frontal cones out of Sephirish's dog, reptilian pet. And of course, you have, have areas that you'll be able to move to to be able to in interrupt his spell wing that will ha have that casted a mass dis um, disorient. All the, all the Shells Angels really low here. It's actually really scary to watch. All getting debuffed right now. We do have death going down on the Windwalker. The Windwalker. <laughs> as expected, the Windwalker immediately releasing, opting to save that battle res. Rogue so sitting at 13%. So uh, their Holy Paladin goes down. Jesus. Their Rogue goes down. The Druid goes down. Everybody is down. Divine Field trying to hang on because there's so much of the trash is low right now. They don't want to wipe the rest of the pack, but there's Explosive bombing the entire terrain as he runs desperately back to where his teammates are released from so they can come and support him and try to finish off the rest of this trash team pog champ on the right uh, on the left excuse me has popped a second round of lust for the mage dr j you're seeing has been bopped in order to prevent a lot of that leap damage and extra damage going on to him making sure that he's able to sit there and park through quaking and get as much damage out as possible in his personal bloodlust this year pops wings just to be able to kind of deal with those explosives they're trying the rest of the team is trying to re uh, you know re rejoin divine field there but when you have all those explosives off at that point, you just have to be healing through every single one because you're not able to kind of get close enough to it. So they do a really good job being able to kite out that pull. And so you're able to actually get everybody topped off there, deal with multiple explosives going off at once. And that was a very scary pull, but a strong recovery there. I mean, it was, yeah, a strong recovery indeed, but it did put them back a bit as Team Pawchamp managed to just kind of just squeeze ahead because of those errors from Shell and are able to pull Sapphire first. Now, we are in an explosive setting here, of course, so they'll have to be careful, making sure to stick near Sapphire as they're doing now, as to not only spawn on Dark Train, the cat too far away so that the Windwalker and the tank can get some effective cleave up, but also to spawn, uh, to not spawn the, the, uh, the I was going to say the bird thing, it's not really a bird <laughs> thing, but to make sure that the uh, the Swarbat doesn't spawn too far away, the Shadewing, yes, that's not actually what it is, that's its name, Jack, but Shadewing, making sure Shadewing doesn't spawn too Skyfins. far away, yeah, Skyfin, making sure it doesn't spawn too far away for the fourth time, Jack, <laughs> so that they can interrupt <laughs> it properly, not have too many issues, and once again, get that cleave up, but by spawning too far away too, you can also spawn one of those orbs a bit far, Jack. And that's where you're going to be relying on more of your ranged DPS, especially, of course, with your boom, or sorry, with uh, the Boomkin, of course, on the side of Shell's Angels, and also the uh, SJA on the side of Team Pog Champ here, to be able to kind of take care of those, and also having that extra coordination when you know, okay, I'm able to rely on, you know, the range to be able to take it out, so the heal, because the healer or the tank, for example, may not be able to reach it. You are seeing Bloodlust going up for Shell's Angels, and again, getting it off a little bit earlier than, than on the side of Team Pog Champ. They still have 15 more seconds to be able to utilize it, and at this point, I would expect them to use it just because of the fact that they're not even halfway through the boss yet. Oh, I think so, too. We did see Shell's Angel is used earlier, as you said, and likely they will have it available for Lura at the end of the boss, because there's still a lot of trash to be coming up. This dungeon will go slower than the counterpart for the 23 level that we saw earlier. Team Pogchamp, both teams actually doing really well to just kind of stick near the boss. I say that, of course, as Jay is seen <laughs> and the Warlock are seen moving away for Team Pogchamp, but Shell's Angels all sticking close by, dealing well with those orbs and moving around in a circle as to avoid all of those traps that are coming down that arm very, very quickly and can stun you for a long amount of time if you get caught. And that's when one of the reasons you see just the whole group shifting together and being able to have it, you know, that close positioning, but also that you know, the standardized movement of, you know, getting further and further away and not having, you know, any backtracking uh, as you're going out there. The only one who's really kind of standing out a little bit has just been SJ. And, you know, sometimes with Dr. J being able to kind of step off to the side, like Dr. J, for example, being very far out, he's trying to move himself over to get back into position with everybody else, but then spreading out, of course, before that quake and damage. So overall, I think it's been very, very clean execution here, but you do have to be watching out for how long these boss fights take because they can be very very intensive, especially on the healer's mana here. A rather amusing kill for Shell's Angels as the cat jumps out to them. Cat's out of the bag there, Jack. About to go down 4%. Now, they managed to pull substantially further ahead, even though they kind of pulled right uh, uh, after Team Pogchamp pulled. So a bit more efficient damage coming out of Shell's Angels as they finish Sapphire off and will be moving over to the third boss's area, likely to skip a lot of that layering trash on the side, go up the middle and pull those five GUIs down to the remaining three, and hope, uh, hopefully they have a good pat, of course, with that Shadow Weaver, but they do have to keep an eye on that pad it's absolutely deadly and one of the things we've seen so many times out of other teams is just having a little bit of extra cc a little bit extra control for example put it, pulling the grand shadow weaver alone to be able to make sure that they're able to focus all of their damage out onto that dark matter when it does come out we have seen a couple detonations uh tonight of course with you know when not being able to have that extra focus on the dark matter can be so so deadly and we and it, it really does add you know that other explosive uh you know is it the second explosive you really need to watch out for but it becomes a much much more lethal
lethal. You've seen Team Pogchamp following suit, of course, going in right up the gut here. It can be very dangerous as you're going forward with that because it's so easy to step you know, a little bit to one side or a little bit to another side and then just instantly start pulling other trash uh, on the way. Which so. I think they might have... No, no, okay. It's just, it's just more GUIs. They just pulled an extra couple of GUIs. Both teams doing the same thing, opting to increase their damage by 100%. The GUIs, of course, by pulling them into that void area on the side in order to skip the patrolling Shadow Weaver coming by, which immediately shells Angels, turns around and grabs as soon as they're able to with those GUIs being dead. Team Pogchamp finishing off the rest of those GUIs in there and we'll have a look as to where the patrol is. There are two other packs that they need to kill in here except for the patrol itself. And you're seeing, of course, Shell's Angels enga engaging with the Grand Shadow Weaver there. Great focus to be able to take down, of course, that Dark Matter. You have only a couple seconds left. It's basically the super-powered version of an explosive. Uh, we'll kind of drag some players in and just deal a ton of damage if, of course, the cast does complete there. So it's absolutely imperative to make sure you're focusing it down and making it that primary target for everybody. You can, of course, line aside it just like with regular explosive orbs, but it does detract from your damage in such a huge way that they really, um, it, when you're in this close of a race, you can't afford it. And they handled it well there. I mean, no deaths on the board from them. They managed to nuke it down, this time not combining it with any of the other trash around. They do finish off what they need to, and then we'll be heading off to the remaining packs before pulling Viceroy, the third boss. Pogchamp on the left side of the screen, dealing with a similar pack. We can see the remaining trash around Viceroy, which does pull, of course, with the third boss, should you decide to pull similar to how Adamin does in Lower Kara. And one of the biggest things is when you're having certain uh, mobs like the Void Flares, which are, of course, just tentacles rooted in place here, you really can't afford to be able to pull everything into there because you just be dealing with all of that all at once. Pogchamp here having a larger pull. You are seeing Muscle Brog going down once uh -oh. again here and having to focus with the extra extra explosive orbs. They do not have a battle res left available to be able to get him back up. So he needs to be able to get back to the group. And they also have to really focus down all of the dark matters that are coming out or really line aside them because they are missing out on one DPS or to help them. This is a tough pull. I mean, this is the big pull that Shell's Angels did in the last map that cost them a lot of wipes combining it with this trash. They do lose their uh, Holy Paladin as well. Dr. J has already procs his cauterized. Ice blocks on top of that to try and stay alive. Shell is still doing what he can to deal with the orbs. Takes a huge hit there from one of the conjurers on the sides. LOS is it line of sights it immediately around the side. Sebs, of course, kiting the mobs around this pillar to help with any line of sight that they can on the caster. The Warlock of ultimately goes down. Mage goes down too. The Blood DK will likely try to keep this alive as they did last time, or as Shell's Angels rather did, to try and not let them reset. The mobs are already low enough, but the DK is not going to be outputting too much damage compared to the rest of the group being there as well. Shell's Angel, in the meantime, being able to clean up the rest of the trash neatly, slowly though, but one pack at a time safely, not getting any more deaths on the board, and they'll be ready to pull Viceroy in just a moment as I mean Team Pogchamp just incurring more and more deaths here they're just throwing their bodies at the rest of this trash pack the Shadow Weaver still has a fair bit of health left Jack and really as you're seeing you know slow and steady has been winning the race here for Shell's Angels there you know half of the deaths that their opponents do have when the Dark Matter goes out of course Sebs is not able to do anything but line of sighted here Dr. J does get clipped by it so his cauterized procs up again which can be very very painful you know again you want to be able to have that to maybe lean on when you go into Viceroy because those ads can have tons and tons of HP to deal with there so it's really a very problematic situation for Team Pogchamp, and they really need to be able to get back into this. Yeah, it's going to take them a bit, and you're right. It would be very painful to be on fire from a cauterized. Shell's Angels having now pulled Vice right now. There are three important casts on this boss. One is just the Dark Blast that occurs on the tank, but you have to interrupt it in order to move the boss, and that's important to get the boss near these tentacles that spawn three at a time randomly around Viceroy's room. Sometimes you can get a bit lucky. All three of them, or maybe two of them, can spawn near the boss. Sometimes they're horrible, and you want to drag them over. Also, you want to make sure that that Howling Terror is interrupted. Casts about every 15 to 17 seconds. If it goes off, everyone is feared for five seconds. Pretty decent tentacle spawn there, I might add. I like and the last one, of course, is the Eternal Twilight. At 100 energy, the boss will summon two Ethereals to his side. The DK will, of course, grip one to the other for effective cleave, as we are seeing here right now. And somebody will need to interrupt this massive cast from the boss, otherwise they will all get one shot, Jack. Yeah, but being able to take care of the Eternal Twilight is very, very important. They're letting cast near completion and interrupting it at the last second. That way they can dodge a lot more of the abilities there. You are seeing, of course, the solar beam coming out. And when you're able to buy yourself that extra time there, it goes a very long way and just kind of prolonging, of course, any more tentacle spawns, prolonging any of the uh, the entor and then tropic force that could be going out, which is, you know, that pushback, which similar to Drezeron will deal quite a bit of damage, but unlike Drezeron, will actually increase in force as time goes on here. 
do well there to interrupt the Howling Terror. Luckily, one of the tentacles did spawn near them. They interrupt that Dark Blast and move over to one more of the tentacles as the Boomkin likely handles the third one off screen right now. But if an advantage for Team Pogchamp here, having two of the range, especially that Warlock being able to multi-dawn all the tentacles, much like the Boomkin is. But of course, Dr. J can flex some support if needed as the Fire Mage. Shells Angels now being pushed back to the outside. Want to make sure you don't get pushed into that purple void on the outside. It does do a fair bit of damage. And you're seeing here is a little bit more spread out, of course, with a lot of the tentacles going out. This is going to be a big challenge here on Seraglio, making sure he's able to heal past two or three tentacles going out at once onto uh, a singular target here as they're both focusing down. Uh, at, originally, they were both focusing down uh, the druid there as they got one of them interrupted very quickly, and they were able to quickly take down uh, the rest of the ethereals that came out to support Viceroy, right? And that's one of the most dangerous situations is when the add priority shifts from killing those tentacles, interrupting the tentacles, stunning the tentacles, onto, you know, the ethereals there as a healer a lot of times you're left holding the bag to make sure people are staying alive and you're going to be able to interrupt that eternal twilight all right you are jack a couple of the members dipping quite low here nothing too dangerous though but i mean it just takes so much time to have to constantly chew through these tentacles especially if they spawn badly on the boss i mean vice is just one pixel at a time getting depleted in terms of health bar on the screen and no different for team pog champ on the left side of the screen they're slowly chew through everything too no extra deaths on the board so both teams just doing their best to survive this boss deal with the mechanics as best they can making sure nothing le uh, uh, frags any of the players kills any of the players and of course interrupting the eternal twilight that could be lethal now as the fight goes on the area around the room does start to cave in just a bit it's at a really slow pace and at this level especially in a non-tyrannical setting shouldn't be anything too threatening and you're seeing here uh sir all is just making sure he's uh, adding some extra damage to those tentacles. He's got faith in the rest of his team to be able to take down the ethereals before he does. So he's making sure he's adding a little bit of effective damage to those tentacles so that when the ad priority then shifts from the ethereals onto the tentacles again, once the ethereals die, you know, the tentacles are near death because by the time they finish up the last of those tentacles, three new ones just spawned. Yeah, it's taken a while, so they're getting some effective cleave here, making sure to interrupt that Howling Dark so no player gets feared. Team Pogchamp slowly catching up a bit. I mean, they're still a fair bit behind, not to mention, as we always do, the six death differential. That's 30 seconds on the clock that they're going to have to make up at the last boss, and there's a lot of burst potential. But both teams have shown, based on the first boss, uh, apparently uh, the cameraman's having just a little too much to drink today, but uh, they have both shown from the first boss that they have really ample burst damage. Both of them ending up at around the same DPS mark from the first boss, slightly in favor of uh uh, slightly in favor of Team Pogchamp, but it won't be enough to overcome a 30-second timer. But we do have death go down for the Windwalker on Shell's Angels. What a surprise. And <laughs> they do immediately res it. They have those three battle reses, but that's another five seconds on the clock, Jack. Maybe they should have left that one, let that one go. We're in a uh, fortified setting, and the boss was at 7%. We then are... again, do they really need two battle reses by the end of the dungeon? Probably not. Hopefully not. And we are also in a precarious position when those ethereals were out. There was the Eternal Twilight going out. I think best not to yeah. risk it because, like I said, they were playing pretty well over the course of the rest of the dungeon there you know they did have you know that full wife that they had to be dealing with or they were able to recover from but after that point like you said there was not really any window for them to actually use any battle reses so two should be more than sufficient for them to be able to take Ludra down here nice to see that both teams this time because team pogchamp didn't do it last time in the the 23 and the 23 replay leaving a bit of overhead for their trash percentage that they will easily complete in the next room containing the last boss Laura they'll run in and there will be two rift wardens here that will constantly need to have their stygian blasts interrupted team pogchamp finishing off so they did close some of that gap. Team Pogchamp now finishing off the third boss as well and is waiting for that RP. Now, Sloot, have you ever heard the tragedy of Lura the Wise? No, Jack. Please inform and educate all of us. <laughs> I removed my headset. It's a Warcraft legend, uh, buddy. <laughs> Lura, of course, was the Naru that had helped uh, Velens and his Draenei actually escape from, from Argus originally. And as his punishment, he was locked away in this cave and turned into a very dark Naru. Jack, that was a very alluring story, but we have to focus more on the match right now. Shell's Angels pull the two Rift Wardens in the room, marking one of them with a skull, prioritizing that damage. Although, if it's anything like the group's I run, skull apparently usually means kill that target last. But hopefully they do kill one of the targets first as to deal with less of the as pouring from uh, the gateways and, of course, the Stygian Blast, less interrupts needed and less damage output on the group. As you see in Team Pogchamp engaging with those Rift Wardens there, they're pulling them up onto the stage uh, on top of Lura, which actually starts the boss encounter, skipping past the arc. RP phase that uh, arrives there. Uh, and of course, they're able to just pull it off the stage. Sometimes you might have to even pull the Rift Wardens completely out of the room to make sure you're resetting the boss properly. But this is a small time advantage that is allowed for them to do, to be able to skip past a little bit of RP and get closer and closer to pulling the boss here. As long as both teams know about it, it's no problem. Both teams do it. They use it to their advantage well here. Now, Shell's Angels, of course, still maintaining their lead. They're getting ready for the actual lure encounter as soon as the boss is pulled.
pulled. They will have about two to three seconds of DPS time, really not much. And after that, the first Greater Rift Warden will spawn on the left side of the room on Shell's Angel's screen. And very imperative to make sure you're getting that first Rift Warden down. Once it does go down, of course, you will have a couple of little uh, uh, Shawlings, Voidlings uh, spawning up there, and you will have to be able to wipe up a couple more of them. Then they will have the Backlash phase where Lura will be vulnerable, taking additional damage here for a very brief window of time. I believe it's about 10 or 15 seconds there. And then two more Rift Wardens are going to spawn. So look for the teams. A lot of times you'll see them actually lusting on the uh, first Backlash. That way they'll be able to carry that Bloodlust over to kill the two Rift Wardens more quickly because of how much HP that they do end up having. It can be such a pain to be able to deal with all of the extra uh, Armageddon effects that these Rift Wardens will want to launch out there. Shell's Angels now getting ready to deal with that first DPS phase. They will likely be using their Bloodlust here. We'll have to keep an eye on that in just a moment. Using it to get as much damage as they can during this 200% increased damage phase for, I think, 10 seconds, Jack. We'll have to double check on that. So there goes the Bloodlust. Anything that's left over, they will immediately spill into the next... Uh, uh, the next Greater Rift Warden phase where there's two of them once again will likely see that Skull Marker come up and they will have to kill one of them quickly in order to kind of stop the flow of some of those small adds pouring in from the portals which do leave the Void Zone on the ground something you definitely want to avoid. And you, <laughs> you do indeed, Sludy. And of course you're seeing uh, as they're carrying over that Lust onto the next two Rift Wardens here it's absolutely imperative to have very strong single target damage because you will have, like I said, these, these shadow crashes that are coming down with a small radius and if they impact and nobody is soaking them they will just completely obliterate the entire party so similar to an armageddon mechanic i think we've seen at some point in this expansion i'm what? not exactly sure seems familiar to me we'll have to google it after this shell's angel is killing one of the greater rift wardens the second one just approaching halfway through the 50 percent mark team pog champ having their first burn on the boss as well and you're seeing you know the team for uh, shell's angels dropping so low you're seeing uh -oh. noru going down so Raleigh just doing whatever he can to be able to top people off he does uh, pop his own divine shield they do have that uh, other other battle res to be able to pop on Duru there. Such a precarious position when you have to be dealing with so much damage, and a lot of times the room just filling up with void zones can be so lethal here. So interestingly enough, I think Team Pongchap actually used their Bloodlust after the first burn phase, hoping to maybe kill both of the Greater Rift Wardens quickly enough to actually use the remainder of the Bloodlust into the second burn, and then afterwards into uh, Laura, who is vulnerable after that burn phase. No bit of RP or immunity phase there, so we'll see if that works out for them. They do have uh, 10 seconds left on it, so they're not going to get the full burn phase out of it, if I'm not mistaken, but I did See that timer come up at least a bit later than usual for that first burn phase. Laura now back in her normal phase just a moment as she finishes her second backlash phase for Shell's Angels. Well, you're seeing as Bolas is finally fading as they take care of the last of the Rift Warden there. Uh, so I think they will actually be in a, a kind of a worse position by lusting so late here. I They're going to get no Bloodlust uptime at all onto it. And while you do have the Rift Warden spawn up immediately as Lura goes immune, the, after you kill the Rift Wardens, there's a delay between uh, the Rift Wardens dying and Lura actually having a backlash there. So I don't really like that. Yeah. I, I, you know, I don't want to fully seal the deal that they popped the, hero, uh, the, the Bloodlust, Rich, it's Bloodlust, <laughs> not Heroism, that they popped it late. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure they did. I just kind of peeked over at the last second and saw that it was a really late timer. So maybe I missed it, but I think that's what they did. We'll have to kind of check the replay for that. Nonetheless, they are definitely behind at the moment, have their work cut out for them, and they certainly ended with Lura in a much higher percentage after her second burn than did Shell's Angels. At this point, Jack, we say it every time, they're really just hoping for a full wipe on Shell's Angels in order to be able to overtake this match. Otherwise, they're going to find themselves in a deficit. And, and Seraglio here is running quite low on mana. He is able to lean onto the Boomkins Innervate if need be, and he probably will be looking to get it very, very soon here. And the consumption. And the consumption, which will be regularly rotated here. And ideally, what you want to be looking at is making sure you're able to track when consumption is going to be able to go out, especially for this combo right here when you're having to deal with the quaking and, of course, the ramping up and the constant ramping up of Lubra's damage would happen over the course of this fight here so very good uh, being able to have beacon of virtue up to be able to quickly top everybody off here so at this point you know you kind of want to start seeing defensives you want to start seeing aura masteries and then hopefully uh, getting up an innervate to be able to spam as hard as you can being able to use your most costly abilities to make sure everyone's going to be in a strong position here but you know like i said the leaning on consumption can also be so huge for the team six percent left on lure here as shell's angels is playing very strong barely safe for a 24 seat <laughs> and taking game one yep I think that's a big thing to note, right? When we actually do look at the performance that these teams had on the seat, well played all around, but we kind of have something interesting in the making here. Shell's Angel's going to pull out ahead. We've already seen this match go down. Question is, now with this advantage, they're going to have that third pick advantage when they actually do get to that final map. If it does, it has to go the distance now. 
is that going to be enough for them to actually change what happened the first time these two teams faced off? Now, of course, Team PogChamp is going to have their map pick. We had already looked at the pool a little bit previously. What do you expect to see, Jack, when we actually do jump into this next pool? We already touched upon the fact that two of their primary dungeons that they are really strong at are no longer going to be in play. Those dungeons, of course, are going to be Black Rick Hold in the Arcway, catering to that mage, catering to that warlock. That's not going to be an option. Is there anything in particular you expect to see from this team? I think part of it, I might be looking to see how safely really that they will be able to play and as familiar with the dungeons that they were kind of seeing. I was seeing uh, Dr. J was kind of tweeting before the match was going up that they weren't really practicing for these 24 dungeons. They were just making sure they're playing to qualify, focusing all their time that they possibly could for that. So I would say maybe something that's they're going to be their absolute safest, most comfortable pick, maybe like a lower Karazhan or something like that. Yeah, I, actually, I was going to say, I think Laura Kara is not a bad pick, especially with a lot of that, you know, Ignite. The trash yeah, density. The, the really. trash density going out. I think that's definitely a pretty strong point for that team. We know his play style, right? That's exactly what he does want there. He wants those dense mobs. He wants to be able to make his class shine. But the, on the other side of things, when we do get all the way to that third pick, because Nagora brought it up as well. She, she said PogChamp really hasn't practiced for this particular round because they've already done probably the most important thing. I, I don't care which style of competitor you are. Your focus is going to be trying to get to that land they did that both of these teams are going to be going to the first mdi land but if you're shells angels when you get your pick going then do you want to attempt to do the opposite essentially and is this when a curveball really may come into play jack i think it's gonna be tough for them i, I mean it's so hard like, like Slut has been saying throughout this entire weekend of having to, the ability to curveball your opponents here and being able to actually take them down uh with something that they're totally unprepared for now i mean we've seen you know 24 dungeons are no joke and there won't be any kind of push over here so i think again it's going to be something that when you're seeing uh shells angels like we were talking about earlier, they've played, played triple Windwalker, they've played all these different comps, they're now moving towards their comfort picks, their safe picks that they probably are pushing keys with on live servers there. So I think something like that is just going to kind of come to, you know, what are they most comfortable with and I'm actually not sure what their uh, their safety pick's going to be. What do you think, Slew? I, I, I don't know because yeah. it depends what means they play <laughs> on live, but you're absolutely right with, with the affix choice here. It's you, you can't really curve the other team. The only thing you can do, at least, uh, you know, to try and just kind of annoy Team Pog Champ is they have the double caster comp, so it's really just to kind of irritate them with some volcanic or anything that constantly starts to displace their range but it's not anything that's going to really make or break that you would be able to curveball a, a no healing team with you know adding a lot of bursting there i think it's clear to see that we're pretty excited to find out what dungeon we'll be jumping into it's going to be on the other side of this break potentially a 2-0 happens or we go all the way to a map three but either way this series will be the decider who is going to be the number one team coming out of europe is it going to be shells Angels, or is it going to be PogChamp? We find out right after this.
it is a rematch in the grand finals, and the tables have already began to turn. Shell's Angels grabs the first W, and now we figured out which dungeon we're going to. But before we do that, I want to introduce the desk. My name is Rich. I'm going to be your host, and our casters for this grand final, Salute and Jack. Guys, we're going to Cathedral for this next dungeon. A very interesting pick, and Explosive is going to be that additional affix, but we should also talk about the other affixes that are inside the kitchen. One is going to be Sanguini, Panini, Linguini. Jack, what do you think about this particular affix in the Cathedral of Eternal Night? Throw it to him and not me. Oh. Uh, take it. Take it away. I mean, Fettuccine Christini. Go, go ahead. That's okay. all I wanted That's to That's all you had, right? That's Thank you, Sloot. Thank you for your contributions. Jack, you got anything for us? Well, when we were talking about Lower Karas, and that was my initial thought that it would be going for. It was a lot of trash dense uh, in that instance, but you're also going to be saying, seeing something very similar when you're coming out into Cathedral, right? We've seen a lot of times where teams are often get that extra skip to be able to have their Holy Paladins or Arrested Druids being able to run all the way upstairs, getting the mass res up before Agronox there. And a lot of times, you know, you are relying on being able to nuke uh, the trash pack right after Thrash Fight there. So I think this should play well into their hands, and it will be, uh, I think it will be very favorable to them. I mean, do you think that this was a pretty strong pick coming out for them? I got a little distracted. I was making a song in my head. I got a really good one. We, we should record a mixtape about Sanguini. Lini, it's going to be fine. Yeah, it's going to be good. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a good pick. Uh, you know, the biggest kind of hold your breath moment for both of these teams is, uh, in my opinion, at least one of them is going to be that start of the dungeon, getting a lot of that trash done uh, at the beginning, like Jack was saying, just because if they mess any of that sequence up, the death, the res at the top, anything, they're starting back at square one at the beginning of the dungeon, so they need to obtain that first checkpoint and have that kind of safety net with Agronox. And, and that's also, that is where some of these affixes come into play. In case you weren't there yesterday, when we really did break down how Sanguine is going to work here. <laughs> Don't know why I said it like that. But the main thing is, is if you kill the mobs in a weird sequence, you can actually... <laughs> I just can't talk weird anymore. Sanguine. It's the funniest word to ever exist. Who's the match with? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I just wanted to make sure they don't get trapped into a sanguine panini. But the, the main thing is here is it's not going to be the affixes. We have relatively easy affixes to deal with. Where do you think that those real pressure points are going to be in the dungeon? Sloot already talked about that first pull. Are there any bosses in particular that you think will be scary here, Jack, on a 24? I have to do with Agronox, of course, is going to be just a lot of tank damage that needs to be uh, focused on. You know, usually it shouldn't be too bad to deal with a lot of the adds there. Mephisroth, a lot of times, is just going to be, you know, that attrition fight for the healer when they're saying, you know, you need to be able to heal through so much damage and be able to, you know, top everybody off. And really dealing very well with a lot of, you know, the uh, constant explosions that are going to be happening, watching out for a lot of the puddles there. You can get very precarious on a 24, even if it's not going to be tyrannical when you're having those detonations going off. Thankfully, on the side of, uh, you know, uh, Team Pogchamp, they will have that double range that they're going to be able to have, you know, constantly being able to run any of the debuffs going out there. So a lot of times they're not going to be messing with melee too often uh, as they're in Mephistroth. Yeah, the other difficult thing, you mentioned Agronox. When you have Sloot casting, sometimes he can be the root of the problem himself. But let's jump straight into it. Map number two of our grand finals. We're going to the Cathedral of Eternal Night. This is a chance right now for the 2-0. But of course, this is Pog Champ's pick. Will they be able to bring it to dungeon number three? Jack, of course, we do have to forcibly sit there listening to Rich kind of, you know, <laughs> lightly as we listen to him, getting some puns ahead of us, and there's just nothing we can do about it in the meantime. But we are back in Cathedral, and you and I both emphasize just how dangerous this first pull is. We already see the Bloodlust get busted out on Shell's Angel's side on the right side of the map. They'll be looking to get this pack down as absolutely quickly as possible, and then probably heading upstairs. I don't think they're going to pull anything extra on top of this. We'll have to keep an eye. I mean, some of the strats have changed, even within the seat that we saw last time. Well, very interesting to see uh, Elzrad is running ahead of course, but by running ahead and actually pulling some of those mobs earlier on, he does activate Dulzak. Dulzak, the mini boss, chasing after Elzrat. So at this point, he's just going to quickly die uh, once his bubble, of course, runs out, hopefully getting it to the top of the stairs as rapidly as possible. That way, he's able to get that uh, continued res on for everybody. But it's interesting to see that Team Pogchamp is not going to be having, uh, you know, the mini boss uh, extra HP that they have to be dealing with. They're just going to focus on getting all this trash down that they can. Elzrat, of course, is getting his res up from his pylon here, copying himself off here. Uh, well, Shell's Angels on the other hand, it's not even going for the skip at all. They're actually taking down the rest of the trash. They're taking down uh, Dual Zack again. You're seeing uh, you know, the Cheat Death going after the Rogue on Shell's Angels here, and they look like they're going to be taking a lot more of a standard route coming up. Yeah, I mean, eventually there will be a skip. We see most of the teams skipping towards the end. I, I, at least I would assume, but I think part of the reason that they pulled some of this extra trash with the mini boss is just because of the amount of health on that mini boss. They want to make sure that they're constantly efficiently cleaving. After they cleared the first set of smaller mobs, they moved on to some more of the trash back, but they will pull the Dreadwing Rider soon. Uh, the Dreadhunter, I think he's 
Moonkin's already in there. They have to make sure to interrupt that fear that goes on on players. Unfortunately, the Moonkin does eat one of the frontals from the mini boss, immediately reses and starts running back. They don't want to use a battle res on that. Team Pogchamp on the left side, we're seeing a huge pull coming in on, in Agronox's room. I think that's everything. Actually, they still have the flowers on the far right beside Agronox. They're going to look to AWE everything down quickly and then get started on that first boss. I'm pretty concerned with uh, Shell's Angels when they're not actually going for that skip ahead. We've seen so many times that you know some of these super fast times for Cathedral are because they're able to facilitate this skip. And while it is, like you mentioned, Sloot, so risky because if they mess up anything from this sequence, they're done. They have to start fresh. They have to go past all that other trash all over again if they're not able to get like the pylon to be able to res them up. But that risk has shown to be worth it here. So all this extra trash that they're having to be dealing with instead of rotating through other cooldowns to be able to take down you know, that huge impile after trash fight, I think that might be setting them back even from the beginning. A bit late for Team Pogchamp. They're moving some of these mobs out from that Sanguini. They did unfortunately have a bit of healing done to them. Nothing too much. They managed to move them out now. It is really important as we always say to kite out of that Sanguine really quickly. Make sure that the mobs don't sit because even if they sit in for a second, they could get some of that healing on top of it. DK running over and I expect a pre-AMS. Yep, there it is. Pre-AMS on the side of the screen. They're making sure he absorbs the explosions from those two flowers as they deal with the last Lasher. Now we have seen that they some teams keep this Lasher alive on purpose as they pull Agronox just to get some of that extra damage and perhaps Proxim Cephas on it as well because they will not have access to ads on this boss at all times. But Jack, there are a lot of ads on this boss. There are tons of ads that they have to watch out for and they kind of pull it halfway into that middle of the room area. You know, that, that way they're not actually fully going onto that other side there. But it puts a little bit more pressure on Elzrath there to take out all those explosives because while you said they are going to spawn uh, additional smaller flowers that will fixate uh, one one flower per person. Those those flowers can also be spawning some of the uh, the explosives that the paladin then is going to take responsibility for taking care of. And the big scary part is, you know, of course, he will have to be standing back. He will have to run towards them, of course, when they do spawn up from any of those ads. Because by doing so, if he was going to be waiting for more at range where the uh, flowers would spawn, there always is going to be that threat that they can spawn right on top of you and then kill you. Agronox being moved over to the other side at his, as he starts to bark out orders and summon a lot of the flowers that come in. A lot of the a lot of his buds coming in as we speak right now, but Shell's Angels still dealing with a lot of that lower balcony trash. It's taking them a while to get up. Finally, we see that mass stealth coming in for them as they work their way upstairs. And you know what? Not really too much avail. I mean, yeah, they're, they've definitely gained some trash percentage. They have all the trash percentage left in Agronox's room, but that took them a bit too long. They had five deaths on top of it without kind of, you know, a suicide skip. Not to mention that they're also not going to be having Bloodlust available for Agronox while Team Pogchamp having the skip. They went all the way upstairs and immediately were able to use their Lust on top of the boss there. So I think a lot of it is going to come down to, you know, how well they're going to be able to get these bosses down. Uh, and also, you know, at this point, Shell's Angels is, it, it's very hard as you're going to see, you know, you're going to see Team Pogchamp going to be quite behind a little bit later on uh, in trash percentage, but all of it will just leap up, get all made up at once right after Thrash Bite comes out here. Shell's Angels still working up their way along to the you have to do that pit stop up the stairwell on the way to Agronox's room as Agronox for a team Pogchamp is just about to fall over. They will have to maybe wait for some of those paths right outside the door. They don't, usually don't take to, uh, too long to go away if they're in a not very favorable position, but most teams do opt to skip it. After that, they will sp get up that spiral staircase, and this is where we're going to see potentially some of the really crazy pulls, but also some of the really dangerous pulls with this fortified affix and explosive too. There's a lot of small ads coming up in this upper area near Thrashbite. Hey, and one of the th most scary things is being able to get all that trash in and knowing what uh, you know your team is able to be really deal with. We've seen, for example, in the 23 setting where they were able to pull everything in Thrash Bite's room all together and, and nuke everything down with that mini boss and be able to heal through all the damage going out there. But on a 24, it might be a lot tougher to see. And you're seeing, you know, when you're not able to get that blistering rain off, you're seeing a, a Team Shell's Angels just taking so much damage. There is going to be a full team wipe when they were not able to take care of the caster ad and the blistering rain and it just wiped them out. Unfortunately, Shell Angels there were just back petaling a bit too much with those flowers, but it just wasn't enough to get them out of that sanguine and ultimately also deal with those explosives. Team Pogchamp actually, I think they did end up pulling one of the patrols uh, that usually go along the side here, so just make sure they finish it at the bottom of the stairs, and then they'll go up. I'm not honestly sure if that was on purpose or not. I didn't get my eye on that in time, but they do deal with a patrol that is often skipped, and now they run upstairs to the ever-important impacts. Yeah, and you're seeing here, uh, Shell's Angels actually trying to get themselves back together. I think they are waiting on maybe one of the patrols. Yeah. I, I see that they're, oh, they they're just, yeah they're getting the res or sorry they got the res from the pylon off but I think they're just 
It was, it They're was sunk. In, it was in too close proximity mm -hmm. of that caster, and I think this is going to be bad news of bears for them all over. They're likely going to have to release at this point. I don't see any other way of them getting back. They're probably just discussing right now what they're going to do. Team Pogchamp on the left side has already started working off with the imps, and of course those book throwers, as we will see them moving into the second boss's room momentarily, and there's a lot of trash in there, Jack. Yeah, and a lot of the trash that they have to be worrying about is going to be, you know, how the imps, getting all the imps, and they actually have some pretty fairly uh, good uh, patrols that are going to be going out here. They want to try to run over to the right side here, get all the rest of it in together before some of the explosives really start spawning here. But it's getting it all mustered up together, and they are avoiding the mini boss like we were talking about because it can be so much more lethal when it's going to be into that fortified setting and so much more healing required. And since they do have access, of course, to double range, they might be looking to have some kind of outranging going on uh, when, of course, the pallet, or sorry, when, of course, uh, the focus destruction is going to be going out there. Yeah, from Gazerax, uh, one of the eyeball bosses, of course. I usually like to kind of make some jokes about this, but they're getting cornea and cornea as we speak. Unfortunately, we do have a huge wipe, actually, just a full wipe going down for, I was about to say a few deaths, but the rest of it really did get finished off there. And we just spoke about how dangerous this room is. Some of the stuns didn't go out on the books. We do see one of those arcane anomalies spawn on the side and a full team wipe. Fortunately, they were able to secure their checkpoint the ever important checkpoint as we mentioned at that first boss and we are finally seeing shells angels back in action as likely this entire time they have run back up to the room they're still just starting now to redeal with the trash that wiped them earlier yeah and you see here i mean even when you think that you're so much farther behind everybody else, you know, anything can happen when you're going to these dungeons. You know, simple mistakes like missing, of course, those interrupts onto the books, spawning the, uh, the arcane reinforcements that are not giving you any extra trash percentage. Uh, and while they do exist for a limited amount of time, they have just tons of health, and they are such a time uh, waster just to be able to kill. So, you know, having to factor those in, the fact that they can also be spawning explosives once you engage with them. I think he's trying to walk around it. I think it has despawned at this point, but they're trying to mop up the rest of the trash here. And again, waiting for Gazerax first, uh, you know, for all the other trash to go down first before they actually end up engaging with them because it could be such a pain to be able to deal with that huge damage from focus destruction here. There is a, uh, a fall explosive off the right side of the screen that did explode there. We saw it spawn with one of the books. Unfortunately, nobody could really tag it too safely as Gazerax was just patrolling through that area. Luckily, no fatalities for the group. They do finish up the rest of the trash here safely, putting all of the sanguine on the outside, and now they're getting to ready to solo pull Gazerax this time and take a more uh, cautious and defensive approach to the fight. Yep, and they have a couple of lingering in. Oh, they actually do, yeah. A couple, yeah, of, a couple of them that they, hopefully they were hoping really would have uh, gone down and already died. So what you'll be looking for here is just going to be that ring of peace uh, going out just before the imps die to make sure you're pushing them away, of course, from Gazerax here. This is going to be ideally the time that you want to do it because it would be so easy to just drop those imps down and if they die during the focus destruction it would be just such a huge pain to be able to have of course the percent healing that will be going out from the Sanguine that will be healing up the Gazerax so rapidly because he does have a large health pool there. But a really good healing out of Elzerat to make sure you're keeping everybody topped off. You were seeing Dr. J actually just coming back into the picture here because he was outranging, of course, the focus destruction. If you stand beyond 40 yards, you are able to outrange it and not be uh, hit by it. But if you start standing at 40 yards or even closer than that, then you will take damage from his focus destruction that's all going out. The problem, of course, being for a lot of the range classes, you then don't have access to do too much damage to the boss, so it's kind of a trade-off there. Now, some of the problem, especially with where they're going to kill him right now, but also where they killed some of those imps, is that they dropped a Sanguine right where the boss spawns. The boss has a really big hitbox. They do have some room to maneuver in this area and make sure that there is no healing from the Sanguine on the boss, but they just made it a bit harder for themselves. They really should have pulled these mobs to the left side off screen, as we're seeing right now, and just put the Sanguine there. Now they're going to have just a really awkward situation, but nonetheless, they do pull Thrashbite and are ready for the second boss. Agronox down to 33% on Shell's Angels. Yeah, but you're seeing Thrashbite here, of course, having to deal with the, the uh, smash into the ground here, living up to his brother's name there in Smashbite. And a lot of the damage uh, will just kind of be focused on, in on that regular cleave that goes out into the group. You will have, of course, his flail that'll be just spinning around the room, but a lot of times it's not really going to be inconveniencing you or any getting anywhere near you. A uh, big thing when he has the charge, just like his brother, you can immunity it with, with for example, Busting Bird protection or divine shield if you so choose or your other option is going to be to run it into the books here which you do have to deal with quickly we do see those tomes spawn and it's really important right now for the players to book it on out of there as that aoe zone comes down making sure to interrupt them because they do cast a lot of damage and slows and just silences a ton of different debuffs on the rest of the group so they do well there to shatter that first uh, that first uh, bookcase excuse me and are ready to kind of restart phase one here the cudgel will be going out soon there it is it's so scary when you are uh, breaking open those books because you will get the slow happening right as he's about to cleave into the ground there so you're seeing you know muscle bra and uh, sebs just barely able to make it out in time the quick freedom going out uh 
uh, for Elzrad to drop it onto Muscle Bros that he would be able to get that extra range out onto them. So if you're not able to annihilate them very quickly, you have to deal with that slow and you have to be prepared to be able to get out so rapidly before, of course, the slow makes it so it's impossible for you to get out. This looks like a really scary pull coming up from Shell's Angels. One of the explosives does go off. A lot of trash that they just pulled, all of that introductory imp trash to the area that currently Team PogChamp is fighting in. Shell's Angels slowly and defensively kiting down the stairs as to make sure that these mobs don't stay too long in their sanguine, but there is a lot of casters, so they constantly need to babysit them, getting some punts and grips, and we see that purgatory proc on their blood DK. Team PogChamp will dealing with the boss and will now aim to pull all of these mobs together and try to kill all of them before they enter the portal. They missed a couple at the start there, unfortunately, so hopefully they have that calculated as some overhead in their trash percentage. But not only do we have the Sanguine, so it's important that these mobs kind of die on the move, but we have a lot of orbs that they need to babysit on the way. But, I mean, they just melt them. Look at that damage coming in from the Mage and from the Windwalker. Yeah, I love what they're focused to be able to get on top of those explosives. It doesn't look like it's too big of a deal, but when you're having four or five of them spawning right as you're trying to, you know, like you said, have a very limited amount of time to be able to get all of these ads down at once, and before you're being overwhelmed with all the explosives, you, you'll see a lot of times if people are not trying to get all of those imps down, what they will often do is just kind of line of sight the ones that do not run away, deal with those line of sighted, that, that way the explosive is not going to be too harmful to them, or of course, like you said, you know, Team PogChamp going in there, getting everything in together and neutralizing it before it will overwhelm them. Yeah, so I mean, Team PogChamp pulling further and further ahead of Shell's Angels only now getting into Thrashbite's room. They will have to deal with all of the trash that we just saw Team Pog Champ wipe on. Similar here from Team Pog Champ, we do see that they have their um, their invis pots. They used it in previous series, I, I believe, as well. The orb caster does patrol back and forth into this room with Nalasha, so we're going to see if they opt to pull it with Nalasha or let it patrol out of that area. Looks like they're letting it patrol. Hopefully they will CC it in the corner, but, you know, they will limit the amount of space that they can kind of deal with this Spider Queen boss, but it's much better than having to deal with the rest of the trash on top of this already dangerous mini boss, Jack. Yeah, and as you're seeing, you know, they're at 90% in terms of trash percentage. They just use that invisibility potion to be able to get around that orb caster and the enforcer a lot of them have so much hp that you have to deal with and they're not required so if you're able to kind of get around them skip around them and you're able to make up that trash by neutralizing so many of the imps it goes a really far away and i believe they might even for them uh you know missing a couple of those imps that went up the stairs after thrash bite i think they will be just a little bit ahead in terms of trash percentage a little bit over but at this point it's kind of unavoidable because you do have to be dealing with the three spiders that are going to be of course spawning uh from now to or so nazasha here and of course nazasha herself dealing so much damage but i like what you're seeing here everyone's stacking up together because you will have that strike coming out of her where everybody will be more or less rooted or slowed and she will fire off a big cone into one direction so being able to just have to move through the boss is so much easier than just having to move you know laterally across the room or moving away to get out of her reach. Dr. J needing to use his ice block there of course a few seconds prior because he did get aggro on some of the newly spawned spiderlings that came in and got two stacks of that poison right away and that poison does a lot of damage on the tank to start with so let alone on a poor mage wanted to get rid of that immediately especially in this uh, fortified 24 setting. They do finish off with a Nalasha and will be ready to head upstairs as the last of the spiderlings are finished off. Now, they are missing 5% on the board. It should be perfectly enough percent from the remaining bats that we will see between the third and fourth boss, so that should wrap up their 100 percentage. Shell's Angels just now dealing with Gazerax on the right side of the screen, so they have a fair bit to go just now spawning the second boss. We'll see them pull in just a moment. Team PogChamp getting ready to actually pull the third boss. Yeah, and you're seeing here, you know, the huge trash advantage that Team PogChamp has and where that skip just really starts paying dividends. You're incurring, you know, five deaths to be able to get up there to begin with but when you're able to get so much further ahead you're able to get your lust off cooldown onto a boss fight uh, and especially like you said on 24s where there is so much HP to worry about it really has been paying dividends for PogChamp and it's really showing that you know maybe this is the curveball that uh, Kells Angel is just not expecting. Domitrax being pulled over to the entrance of the room we do know he spawns the two portals at 90 and 50 percent. The set at 90 not as dangerous they do spawn some uh, small imps it's really imperative that you make sure you interrupt them grip them over whatever it may be they do a ton of damage with their cast. We're talking 4 to 5 mil in this 24 setting on the player. So if they accidentally leak a cast on a non-tank, it could actually be fatal. At 100 energy, Domitrax will do a massive chaos energy, uh, chaotic energy, excuse me, cast. Any players caught outside of that shield in the middle will essentially get one shot immediately. But every time that chaotic energy or his frontal cleave 
hit that shield in the middle, it would decrease the amount of charges and size that it has left. So it's important for players only to use it as needed, because while you're in there as well, you also heal and damage for less. We are starting to approach that 50% mark, Jack, where, of course, the two new portals will have more dangerous mobs in those Shivara. And it's very important, because the chaotic energy does come out when Domitrex is at full energy here, that they'll kind of sit very closely to the boss. That way, when they do jump in for this chaotic energy, they will be able to, you know, spawn some additional resources. They get them as close to 50% as they possibly can here. Then they do start pushing him over the top to be able to activate, like you said, those last couple portals here. And th really, this is the decision time where you start seeing if they are they are going to use their last Bloodlust on the fight on Mephistroth or here. And it speaks to just how confident they're going to be on getting the you know the Shavara down very rapidly and also neutralizing the Fell Portal Guardian. So when you're seeing you know, the first Portal Guardian going down in the first seconds that it does spawn, you see they have no problem with focusing their damage, splitting up their damage accordingly. And again, at this point, it's just going to be uh, you know, cleaving down the, the Shavara, keeping one banished so that they're able to get this constant Sefu's proc here and so much easier to deal with. So we do see the banish come up from the Warlogs just to get that Sefus proc. Really nice ring of peace there down from the Monk as all the players get inside. As you mentioned, the Mistresses do have that kind of AoE shadow world that will punt players away. So it's really bad if you get one of the Mistresses to get into that shield with you and punt you out at just the wrong moment as the Chaotic Energy is about to finish this channeled cast. It will kill basically everyone in the group. Maybe not the tank. Domitrax entering 20%. He will get a minor Frenzy and Rage here where he increases his attack speed. I believe damage is... Actually, no, I think it's just attack speed. So a lot more damage coming in on the tank, but after this, there's no more portal spawns, keeping that Vanish on the side. That mob, of course, will disappear when Domatrax dies in just a few percent here. Yeah, but they constantly have that close uh, positioning there to be able to stay close to the Aegis, just continuously building up resources there for the melee, even when they're not actually going to be able to do additional damage, or their additional damage will be heavily reduced. So very, very clean play out of Team Pogchamp to be able to get this down. And like I said, the final 5% will be the rest of these Shade Wings, be able to take them down very quickly, which will then spawn Mephistroth. So that we do have the last of the Dreadwings, the four bats that will be giving them the remaining percentage. Of course, we have gone to full screen PM mode at this point. Shells Angels just a bit too behind on this map pick by Team Pogchamp, but we will be keeping an eye on them for sure. Team Pogchamp looking really strong to finish off this dungeon soon. But first, of course, they must overcome not only this trash, but they will have Mephistroth, the final boss of the dungeon, a massive blue Dreadlord, which will spawn with, I believe, 60, 50, 60% 60 of his energy bar. Once he hits that 100 energy, we'll enter the second phase of the fight, which is sometimes could be one of the harder parts of the phase, but the phase one jack is something is nothing rather to scoff at. There's a ton of damage going on in the group. We have the frontal carrion swarm on the tank, and of course we also have the pillars and the shadow clips on all of the members. Yep, and it, you know at this point I think you know when they're in the European region when they have to be defending Illidan here, I think their their skills at being a goalie for him will be quite strong here. So Mephistroth, of course, going out, you will have again uh, you know these little spawns uh, that will be the little focus destructions that need to be uh, out of the group, and they will always prioritize range players here. So you'll be seeing it going out on Doctor J and. And SJ constantly throughout the course of this fight. There will be quite a bit of damage that will be going out in addition to, you know, some of the uh, little AOE splashes that, as you're seeing the small dots that go out. They're not too big of a deal when there's only on, you know, one stack on each target, but whenever you're having, like, melee stacking on top of each other, you have to watch out. You're seeing that light spread between the Paladin and, of course, the Muscle Bra to be making sure they're not splashing on top of each other and not adding and contributing any extra damage there. So we're seeing the second phase start here. We do have about 40 seconds at the start of that first phase. Perfect amount of time for Bloodlust as we see the team pop here. Now the tank will be responsible for defending Illidan, who for some reason is wearing a blindfold in this scenario and cannot see the balls that are about to hit him in the face in just a moment. Really important for the players to try and clean up one of the sides of these images to kind of concentrate where the balls are coming from as to not allow Illidan to get hit well, at all, let alone too much, because every ball that connects with Illidan's face will extend the rest of the phase by about four seconds, increasing the amount of AoE damage that's pulsing on the group. Once enough time has elapsed and Illidan will find Mephistroth take him back out of the shadows, and we restart phase one here. Yeah, but you're seeing, you know, Illidan will actually kind of pivot himself to be able to, you know, almost look at it through his blindfold on which of the shadow orbs are going to be closest to him. So excellent job there at Seb to make sure that he's going to be, you know, watching where Illidan is pointing to, watch where all the balls are going to be coming towards him and blocking them out uh, as rapidly as they possibly can there. And at this point, you know, like I said, the phase resets, they're going to be dealing with the spires once again and that continued stacking damage. And the higher that the key, this key goes, you know, the more that it's going to be relying on that attrition healing, being able to rapidly top everybody off on this increasing damage uh, that will be coming out in just a second as these spires spawn. And then 
being able to make sure everyone's staying spread out, of course, to be able to deal with some of the splash AoE. And not to mention, of course, the swirlies that the bats are throwing on the ground. You want to make sure you're getting out of that because it does do about a, a mil and a half, something like that damage. It would be really bad news if they managed to connect with you during some of this AoE. So as long as you're moving out of this, especially not letting it clip during any other pulse, it should be all right. But Mephistroth does go down and Team Pogchan ties the series at one apiece, Rich. Absolutely beautiful as well, and we're starting to see how important pick can be, especially when you get to these plus 24s. Do you guys, that, that's kind of the first question I wanted to ask you. Do you feel like the pick, actually, we've seen it already be a very important thing, but when you get to a key that's as difficult as a plus 24, do you actually think the pick gets more important to a degree, Jack? Oh, I think so. And it also is going back to how well these teams are practicing, what their focus is going to be on, you know. So as we were seeing, you know, throughout the start of this dungeon, you know, Team Pogchamp really was setting the pace. They were showing that, hey, we're going to do this skip off the pull. We're going to be making sure that once we get past all that extra trash that's going to be in that uh, first opening hallway, that we're going to keep on extending our lead because we're taking and dealing with the trash that has less health and is more dense and giving us even more percentage than, uh, you know, our opponents are going to be able to get uh, by taking on the larger mobs. Now, hey, we talked about that pick what do we expect to see coming into the next one we know that this is a pool that's a little bit different than we have seen before could be quite a difficult one to actually pick but shells angels they've actually been able to put themselves in a good position in regard to picks because they won the first map why not have a repeat of what just happened with method i mean they looked very dominant in bolt of the wardens we have that as available in this map pool. So I think we're just going to go back to Volt of the Wardens if I was Shell's Angels. I mean, they looked really, really solid in that dungeon. So I think we're going to have a repeat here. But of course, this actually, no, both times on 24. So I think we're just going to have a repeat. Salute. I, I got to agree with you there. I, I think that that's one of the most important things we need to think about what we've seen this team do before. They have looked lights out in Vault of the Wardens. Will that be their selection? We're going to find out after this quick break, but one thing is for certain, regardless of which dungeon it is, it is going to decide who the number one team truly is in Europe.
we started off with the eight best teams in the region that was widely considered to be the best in the world. They're going to have to prove that soon. These are going to be their two champions, but this will be the final dungeon, the dungeon to determine who the number one team from the scariest region in the world truly is. My name is Rich, and I'm going to be your host. And joining me on the desk, we got Jack and we got Sloot. And Sloot, you made a prediction that I think Jack and I both agreed with wholeheartedly before we went to the break, and it is going to be correct. Kells Angels have locked in Vault of the Wardens as the dungeon to decide it all. Which team from Europe is truly the best? We've already seen a bunch of upsets, and we've seen these two teams make it to the grand final. It's a rematch. The last time, it was PogChamp who got the best of this team. Do you think this is going to be the pick that's going to allow them to rewrite their fate? I mean, you know, Shell's Angels, we saw how they performed on this exact same map in 24 in the, in the previous series, and I mean, they, they nailed it. They knocked it out of the park, so... But, you know, at this point, Team Champ saw them perform, I'm sure. They know what their pull pattern is like. They know where the tricks... Uh, ticks tricks and tips there we go, there we go. are for uh, the team and maybe might have altered some of their strategy well or perhaps they've already prepared something on their own we'll just have to see but it's going to be really tough to beat shells angels on this map pick start to finish they were really strong and and jack it really all starts with that first pull we saw just even against method right method was able to get a very decent pull going at the beginning but when everything was said and done for them, they pulled the boss a little bit later and you look at the, the percentage done and they're quite a few percentage below Shell's Angels. So is that first pull going to be one of the key indicators of this game for you? I think it's gonna be the consistency over Vault of the Wardens. I think Cathedral was one where it, right off the start, PogChamp just took it out, took, took over the game completely. But with Vault of the Wardens, because there is, well, you do have all the trash that's gonna be going down rapidly. I don't think that's really gonna be a problem for Dr. J and, and the rest of his team because they do really shine when there is high trash density being able to take care of it very rapidly. But I think the Vault of the Wardens especially is going to be the skips, being able to kind of dodge around a lot of the extra trash that you'll be able to see there. You know, for example, uh, the combination of being able to have your invisibility potion right after Ash Golem to get past, uh, you know, one of the mobs that are just going to be blocking their way so they don't have to loop all the way around. Then they're going to be able to use their Shroud of Concealment to be able to use it to uh, skip past all the extra uh, spider mobs at the very, very end. That combination really saves them a lot of extra seconds that really made a lot of difference whenever, whenever, Method and uh, Shells uh, was actually playing together. Like There was a couple seconds here and there that was making a world of difference, and those are the little tricks that really helped seal the deal for them. I think one of the biggest things is exactly that pull you're talking about. We see them perfectly getting the trash to a point that they're walking right up to that door. The Fell Song is behind, and they're managing to skip majority of that trash. Now, the thing is, is do you think PogChamp is going to go for this strategy as well? And also, salute to kind of pick your brain just a little bit. You obviously are, are running keys constantly. Is this a strategy that you have already been employing or is this pretty new for most people who are watching the MDI? Yeah, it's not really new to skip a lot of that dark area. We do see different strategies sometimes with pulling, you know, the dog on Inquisitor, uh, some of the dogs on Inquisitor Tormentrum if they want to. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they pull extra trash at the start. So there's a, definitely a few ways to go about this dungeon rich. There really is. But oftentimes you do see at least most of that kind of the dark region, uh, you know, once you get down that elevator pulled, whether or not they end up skipping the Dreadlord and the Jailer at the same time or not really remains to be seen. It kind of depends on the speed of the group. Do they have a rogue? Of, of course, in this case they don't but it, a lot of variation covering these two teams i don't expect but who knows what pog champs plan is yeah. but i don't really think pog champ is going to be changing too crazily their strat just to try to get that first place i think that at this point fr frankly they're ecstatic to be here they're they're happy to have made the globals they do want that first seed but to just have a huge risk there's no reason for them to take a huge risk with their strat change right now Whew. all right well we are ready to jump into this one and that is an important thing to know what Sloot just said both of these teams they have guaranteed that they are going to go to the global final they will be able to compete at the first mdi land and on that global stage to prove that they are the best team in the world but on the line here is their pride and figuring out who the best in the region is. Shell's Angels has already proven they're great on this map. Let's see what PogChamp can do. Quick Blessing Protection coming out onto a Divine Field there. He's going to be able to grab all these trash mobs in together, going right up into the stairs here, you know, carrying, <laughs> carrying everything back with him. I love how long Blessing Protection lasts. You never really notice until you're getting everything in together here. 
I mean, it's quite a, uh, it's quite a plus, I was going to say. They pull everything in right away. Now, in this fortified setting, the most dangerous mob that we're going to see here is really Glaviana. I mean, she is a force to be reckoned with. She tr got that metamorphosis going on at 50% HP, doing increased damage to the group, starting to pulse on the group, too. A bit of kiting coming out of the tank here. Everyone making sure to avoid the tons and tons of volcanic that are going on. And, of course, both teams, Jack, have used their bloodlust. Yeah, both teams using their bloodlust, and it really shows that, you know, Team Pop Pogchamp looks like they're mopping up the rest of the mobs here, or Shells Angels. They're having a little bit of the mobs just being spread out here uh, as well, but it's always important to watch. You know, Purgatory was already procced on Divine Field here. Everyone's very, very low here. Seraglio, of course, dying and having a couple extra deaths coming out. As you mentioned, you know, Glaviana getting so deadly, so scary uh, at the last couple percentage of HP and is really taking them down really quick here before deaths. I mean, Shells Angels really just kind of flopping in a nutshell here, if I were to say. They do kind of this pull that we saw them do in the previous series quite flawlessly, just kind of catches up with them here. Four deaths on the board. Team Ponchamp already moving past. They did a, a bit more of a conservative pull, but it didn't cost them all those deaths, so a bit less risky on their part. Finishing up Laviana, arguably maybe the most dangerous mob in this entire instance on this 24 Fortified. They do start curling up the right side. And you're just having more and more deaths coming out for the team. Six deaths here. And while they're at 43% trash percentage, you know, it's not making a huge difference for them uh, a lot of times. Because you're seeing, you know, Team Pogchamp busting out the invisibility potions very early on. You know, skipping past a lot of the more lethal trash that, like I said, will be very, very time-consuming for them to deal with. So at this point, they're much more concerned about playing it safely and securely rather than uh, being able to have those larger aggressive pulls that really cost Shell's Angels six deaths. Right, Gerard Jack, Team Pogchamp, they're having their uh, invis pot where off right before the boss so they of course have to pull the two mobs in front of the boss but also the two that were patrolling to the back of the room might as well pull everything together get a bit of that extra percentage down and then they will have to deal with Tirithon, the first boss of the dungeon shells angels as we can see does use their mass stealth here as well but i they get caught on the side right now with the wind walker walking just a bit too close they do manage to reset actually the blood decay needs to back up grab everything as the other <laughs> members kind of run out drop the failure detection pylon and this is just an absolute nightmare for a uh, shells angels right now another full wipe they wasted their mass stealth right now so they'll have to come back and either clear some of this trash or use their invis pods in the meantime on the left side team pogchamp is already working on tirathon the first boss yeah tirathon again at, at, almost at 80 percent here as shells angels incurs 11 deaths to be able just to be able to get into the room here you know trash percentages are not too far apart at this point it really shows you know just how well the different, how big of a difference 23 to 24 can make here. But it's also very surprising when, like you said, this they had already done this dungeon on a 24. They already pulled off those aggressive pulls cleanly. They already were executing the you know the group stealth you know efficiently here. And it, it is kind of disappointing to see for a team that was playing lights out against Method. They're kind of making quite a few mistakes. Now, a bit of a pain in the butt, this boss for Team Pogchamp with the kind of comp that they have. Once that glaive chain does go down, they will constantly have to run around in circles around that middle fountain area, uh, middle fountain area running a terathon, if you will. But they do have to keep moving, and it's you have to always pre-park as the range constantly because you're being displaced non-stop. Once they get to that 40% range, he will transform into his Havoc form, starting to pulse a fair bit of damage on the group. Group doing well here, of course, to constantly interrupt these Fell Furies as they come in. You don't want them reaching 10 steps and exploding on the group. But you can see how tight-knit they are, and none of the casters are sitting too far in the back by themselves. Yeah, but you should be seeing, you know, like I said, the constant displacement of the range DPS can be such a pain, especially when you're going to be wanting to cleave onto the Scorches as rapidly as you possibly can there. So when you're getting to that point where you want to be able to get extra cleave onto them, you need to make sure they're going to be funneled into the tank, of course, uh, as rapidly as you can here. So Dr. J just taking advantage of his blink to be able to get around that chain, be able to move as little as possible. Unfortunately, you're not seeing SJ being able to take the same same advantage, uh, unfortunately, because anytime that you are stepping through, or if you are going to be use like a portal to walk through it, or anytime you pass through that chain, it will just deal immense amounts of damage there. Also seeing that, like I said, the hatred coming out when he does go into his Havoc form, and that will give you a small grace period if it does spawn on you to be able to get out extremely quickly. But They're if being... you do not, it will just deal so much damage there. And that was a huge swoop. No, that was a huge swoop, but also the th three of them got caught in the corner there with that chain swooping in. A lot of damage coming in on Elserat, the uh, the Holy Pattern. And luckily, no death there, but we did see some desperation. He was coming up as they managed to squeeze out of that corner. Team Pod Champ looking now in a good position to finish the boss off with hopefully no deaths for the remaining 5%. Uh, Shells Angels, not too far behind, though. I mean, you know, the deaths are one thing, and we got 55 seconds on the board right now, but 
Bat. They are at 34% on the boss, so they managed to output a lot of that single target damage. Tirithon now just kind of lingering around at that 2% mark. We are moving on into the Imp Hallway where we'll see, one, uh, we'll see the tank, of course, pull one side and somebody else will pull the other. They'll combine everything in the middle with that mass grip on top of the Imp Mother and get as much damage in as they can and AoE. Yeah, but you're seeing here, just being able to combine them all, of course, together. You know, they do give a decent amount of extra percentage. So the, the bop goes out onto Muscle Bra. That way he's able to actually get everything in and also have no threat generated when, uh, you know, eventually his bop does fall off as he funnels everything into the tank there. So making short work of all those imps and taking out their foul mother. Uh, and at this point, because this mob often does look like a pushover, it's always important to make sure you're staying on your toes. There is, of course, that AoE that can happen very, very quickly that she will spit out onto one player. Uh, the three different bursts that will kind of combine and do have the potential to actually deal so, so much damage. So it's always important, you know, at this point, you will get kind of amped up after killing a Tirithon, and you kind of want to be able to, you know, take a break and keep on talking to everybody. And, you, you know, it's so important not to lose focus to be able to, you know, actually have a couple deaths here, because it's very easy just to slip up, take extra damage. You're seeing Dr. J taking a couple of the actual barrage hits there. Oh, it's upsetting to see the children go before the parent, but the imps must go as the foul mother is about to fall as well, grabbing whatever small imps they can at the end for the bit of percent. I think it's 0.4, 0.5%, something like that per imp. So a lot to be made up here, 63% for the team. They will be heading over to the elevator, leading down to uh, Inquisitor Tormentrum, the second boss of the dungeon. Shell's Angels also now dealing with the mother, already down to about 30% on her. So in terms of raw dungeon progression, not too far behind, but again, a theme that we're constantly going to revisit for this dungeon. 11 deaths to overcome, almost a minute. It, huge amount of time. Team Pogjam already priming to pull Inquisitor Tormentor and then just do just that as Muscle Bra has vanished off the face of the planet right now. Yeah, and it looks like they're dropping the pile on there. It looks like they are going to end up ha just having that full wipe. I think he might have actually fallen through the elevator floor and actually had been beneath them. So at this point, they need to be able to drop, or actually their whole team wasn't with them. So you're seeing the Holy Pally just off the screen here. The, their Holy Pally is probably at the top of the elevator. And of course, whenever you activate the boss, the elevator doesn't come back down. It doesn't keep moving all around. It stays up top. So he they might have, left gone, without he might have gone for a little joyride back upstairs, just making sure that Foul Mother doesn't come back. The rest of the team is waiting for him to get back in. We do see the buffs reappear on the raid frames, meaning he is once again within range. The teams hug and reunite immediately as Shell's Angels is now already on Inquisitive Tormentor. This could be part of the break that they were looking for right now. I mean, we've shaved that death differential down to seven now between the two teams. Only 30 seconds, and uh, here we go again. Yeah, man. Would, would you ever leave me behind? Would you ever leave your healer behind you know, as you're pulling Tormentum? Again, I probably wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Probably. We'll see about that. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's already happened a few times, but Inquisitor Tormentor down to 87% for Team Pogchamp, and the first phase 70% for Shell's Angels, where he opens that first jail area. We do know, of course, that at 40 and 70%, he will open the jails, the tormented orbs in the middle of the room. Want to make sure that you're looking at those as that Swirly line finishes its cast, else you will be disoriented. Also important to note that while there are those four prisons that do uh, spawn different ads, there will only be two that will spawn at any one point in time, and they are regularized, so there will be, you know, the same ones coming out every single time. Time. At this point, you will have the Demon Wing uh, will then be followed. I believe it's going to be followed by the Old Gods right after that. So very important as you're going into these, be able to take care of that Blade Lord very rapidly because he will have that charge that will just stun one player and deal so much damage. And I believe he also drops threat. He does drop threat when he charges and punts and stuns that one player indeed. Inquisitor Tormentorum being moved up to the top for Team Pogchamp. Uh, you know, something that we typically see teams do. And over on the right side, Shell's Angels will now head over to the other side. Of course, not to say hello to Adele, but rather to deal with the remaining gel that will open at the opposite side of your Team Pogchamp, though, doing a strat that, you know, we do see sometimes teams do. They tend to line of sight the second jail, uh, jail cell, allowing the mobs to kind of filter in and cleave everything down. But oftentimes, you don't really need to do that when you have access to not only a DK, but a Blood DK as well, who has that AU grip available if they want. Nonetheless, we'll see if it works out for them. It will decrease their overall damage just a bit because they'll have to deal with the mobs as they come in and constantly kind of peek in and out from behind the wall with the volcanic going on. Shell's Angel is looking in a pretty good position right now, 25% on the boss and well handling the new jail full of ads. Yeah, and as you're seeing, you know, the wasted uh, opportunity time, really, because you will have to keep in mind that, yes, you know, Tormentrum will be immune as he is unlocking all those prisons, so you're not able to clock in that extra damage there, but this entire period when he runs from one side of the room all the way back to them from that line of sight there, wastes so much time, and they're spending, you know, seven or eight seconds not being able to dish out any damage, and this is the opportunity, like you said, Shell's Angels is going to need to be able to capitalize on in order to, you know, catch up in this game and really start pulling away, because at this point, like you said, they need to pull away. They need to have a 35 
five second advantage or more to make sure they win this key. Yeah, I mean, they really need to shell out as much damage as possible. Inquisitor Tormentor about to fall here. They'll be all head over to that Shavara, surrounded by the four dogs, the Scorchers, and the Defiler Scorchers of exploding for damage, of course, when they die. And the Defilers need to have that Drain Cast interrupted as it will stun players. A lot of damage that'll come here on the tank. And, of course, a lot of explosive damage, too, from the Shivara. Also want to make sure not to cast during that Piercing Shout, much like I do on my <laughs> Shadow Priest oftentimes, because you will get locked out for five seconds. You mean your Dis Priest? Yeah, it happens. Oh, Don't worry, man. Do, it's okay. But important to know the dogs that are surrounding this Shivara are, of course, the Defilers and the Scorchers. Like you said, whenever the Scorchers do die, they will pulse out this big AoE, so it's very important to make sure that you uh, desync the uh, the deaths of those both, or otherwise you'll be taking a huge amount of damage there and stressing out your healer quite a bit there. So we're seeing a bit of extra dog pull coming in from Team PogChamp. They are substantially behind on trash. We're talking 19% right now, actually 21 at the moment. Um, so they're trying to kind of round up anything they can along with this Shavara to get as much cleave as possible and be able to prime themselves for the skips later in the dungeon. Shell's Angel finishing up the trash right now, after which they will have access to one of the next two bosses, either, of course, our Lord and Savior, Glazier, or they can go over to Ash Golem, but they choose to go over to Glazier first. Yeah, but this is what we've seen last time out of Shell's Angels, where they are opting to go to Glazier first, and then they end up uh, you know, going to Ash Golem, and then using, of course, their invisibility potions uh, to be able to skip past, like you said, the Dreadlord, and the Jailer at the exact same time here. So starting off with Glazer, and they will also be able to capitalize on Bloodlust in the vulnerability phase if they want to, but I believe last time we saw them using it on Ash Golem. If not Ash Golem is usually a bit more efficient just because that vulnerability phase, albeit it is 100% damage taken on Glazer and only 20% on Ash Golem. And Ash Golem is it's a much longer period of time, and you can easily get Glazer almost... You can almost kill him, actually, within that window for 100%, so you're largely going to waste a big part of your Bloodlust if you tend to use it on this fight. I mean, maybe they will. In the end, we'll see. Not doing the best job in the world to bait some of those blue orbs back into the boss that time. We do know that they target the closest person to them when they bounce off the wall, making sure, of course, here to kill that overloaded lens as to not pulse too much damage on the group, and then redirect that beam right back into Glazer's bum, making sure to shatter the shield and expose him for that increased damage taken, Jack. Yeah, but he's really close uh, there by Doru as, of course, he was dodging that ball very, very rapidly. I'm sure he'd be able to dodge anything at this point now. Wrenches, cars, you name it here. So, great play there. And at this point, they do actually uh, offer the Bloodlust, trying to burn them down as rapidly as possible so they're making sure they're only getting that one phase to deal with. And you're seeing a shine, uh, of course, procking his cheat death there as you do have to watch for a lot of the slow areas and also some of the orbs that are going to be coming right back into the boss on top of them. Yeah, and of course, we do have Glazer be moved over to the side of the platform. Doesn't have the best death per session, so you want to make sure that you're kiting a lot of those orbs back into him as they slowly move the boss out. Glazer will be going down here in just a moment. Doesn't even blink twice at the thought of living any longer. Shell's Angels move over to the hallway leading up to Ash Golem, our resident molten giant that actually starts in a very frozen state. But we do, see, as we see the preview there for Team Pog Champ on the left side of the screen of that boss. Yeah, and as you're seeing, you know, he, he only has one eye, so he only is blinking once before he does go down there. Shell's Angels is working on just their fourth boss in the instant of Pog Champ. You know, has skipped uh, at the moment Glazer so far. So you'll probably be seeing, you know, Pog Champ busting out the lust, like you said, for Ash Golem to make, to make sure they're having that longer lust duration to be able to burn it down very quickly there. But I do think it's definitely a threat, uh, you know, when you're dealing with Glazer of having enough damage to guarantee you're going to get past, uh, you know, you're only going to have that one intermission phase to deal with. So I, I definitely uh, I definitely like that they use the Bloodlust there to guarantee that phase, even though if it may have wasted just a little bit of duration, and they'll have to spend a little bit more time here on Ash Golem. I agree with you. Team PogChamp now dealing with this brittle phase. Of course, things have gotten cold as ice. They are willing to sacrifice. They have about 20 seconds to go. The brittle does end as things start heating up here again on the platform. Volcanoes go down on the edges. That will start spewing up some extra damage, and we will have some molten areas on the ground. If any of these make contact with a player, they do absorb them, but they incur an eight-second dot. That's pretty nasty, especially as we're increasing in difficulty on the dungeons. However, if it comes in contact with any of the lesser elementals that spawn, and one actually just spawned right on top of that fire, it will end up exploding for a bit of damage on the group. Yeah, but you see there, as you're having, you know, two different lines, like the hands of a clock going out at once, waiting for those to align before the blood decay, as you're going to see Kel's Angels is doing right now, waiting for them to align before you pre-AMS and run over all of them, getting as many as possible. But again, same story. We're getting those lesser elementals, hitting that extra flame patch. You're having to deal with the detonate, and usually it's going to be one detonate, not dealing too much damage to the rest of the group, but if you're getting, you know, a consistent amount of elementals that you are ignoring, it can quickly at stack up very, very rapidly. So you're seeing on the side of Team PogChamp, where now they're, you know, dragging all the adds on top, of course, all of these elements and working on getting them down very quickly if they can. Yeah, they keep dragging the boss around, and it's really good for them with that cleave. Shell's Angels now, I mean, they're a fair bit ahead. Keep in mind, we haven't had a kill from Glazer for Team PogChamp. 
There still is that death difference of 30 seconds, six death between the two teams. But I think at this point, Shell's Angels is actually looking to be in the favored position, even with that kind of death situation between the two teams. Shell's Angels working on their second brittle phase, 20% increased damage taken on the boss for 20 seconds. We'll be easily able to get them down here, and they'll already be able to start working on their skips and getting downstairs to that dark area while Team Pog Champ hurries as quickly as they can over. We already see that, uh, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the swiftness spot, not the swiftness spot, but we see the, um, the sky step potion. The sky step. Thank you very well, much, Jack. It's been a long day. Uh, <laughs> on the favor of the Punt DK, not the most mobile tank in the world, moving over to Glazer. Yeah, but you're seeing here Shell's Angels, like I said, being able to get that invisibility potion to quickly skip past, of course, you know, the uh, Dreadlord right there and still having enough duration to be able to skip past, uh, of course, the Jailer that's going to be going out there. Uh, so it's very, very important. And you're also seeing the Distract going out so that the, uh, the Boomkin is not forced into using the invisibility potion if they don't need to. And then, of course, they're able to use the avalanche potions here to guarantee that they're not going to actually take any fall damage. Or you are going to see that lovely, lovely flap coming out from, of course, the Boomkin there. But if they are running against the wall there, as the uh, elevator comes back up, they're able to fall through the floor, then use their avalanche potions again. That's why you kind of see a little bit of bugging out there as they're running up against that wall there. But it is well worth it to make sure that they're able to skip past the elevator quickly. Certainly did not have RNG favor them as the elevator came back up there, but not too much time lost. They do throw the light ahead of themselves, getting ready to stealth through this uh, the spider link pack. Did they use their invis pots, of course, for the Jailer? So uh, it looks like... Uh, At this point, they're just going to be focusing on using Shroud to be yeah. able to get past here. And the nice thing about Avalanche Potion is that it is a duration effect. It is actually not going to be... Uh, they're actually not using Shroud. They're, they're oh, the Shroud had actually expired. Oh, no, I, I thought you meant past this pack here, which they're actually opting to just kind of suicide run into and res up on the other side with. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, because the Shroud does have that shorter duration or you do have to be worrying about any of like, the extra fall damage that's going to be going out, I think it might have just been that the Rogue had gotten knocked out of the Shroud early for everybody else. So as a result, he, they just opt to have the, the mass death. Very great presence of mind at Adoru to make sure that he's throwing the orb ahead. Because if you do, do die with the flashlight orb, it will actually spawn back at the original conduit. That is quite the pain in the butt, let me tell you. Glazer going down on Team PogChamp. They'll be prepping up to get started with the skipping as well. But Shell's Angels looking in a great position here as they get up to the final two mobs of the dungeon. Looking to kill that Spirit of Vengeance first in order to unlock the door. As soon as you do that, the door to Cordano will unlock. Somebody can run over and start that RP, but also you don't want uh, you don't want the Vengeance living too long. A lot of splash damage on the group, and it also punts the tank away, leaving the melee prime for a melee from the mob itself as the tank gets punted away, unless they use those barbed wires to get rooted in. Yeah, and I was about to say, you know, nice when you're able to have the Broodmother nearby, because they will spawn those little thickets that you will be able to root yourself into, making sure that you're going to be able to root yourself when you do get kicked. That way you won't actually have to worry about putting the lives of your other two melee at risk. Your RCNC are, of course, running ahead to make sure that he's able to start the RP, and then just kind of running back to be able to join his buddies here. Yeah, and of course, uh, we do have the death from the tank going on. Team Pog Champ, he's the one that kind of pulled the Jailer to the side there, so kind of a forced death in that regard. The Rude Mother taking a fair bit to kill. Now, we are in that fortified setting, so a lot of health on this one mob, almost mini-boss style. Um, they are finishing it off in a moment. Cordana's RP has started, so they're primed to pull the boss immediately upon getting to her platform. Yeah, but you see, as they're taking down, of course, that brood mother, they are, like you said, getting ready to take down Cordana. There's a 40-second death differential, but at this point, it does look like, a, you know, Cal's Angels is way more than 40 seconds ahead. I mean, it could be pretty close. It depends how Team Pogchan does the rest of the skip and really how quickly they're able to get that Broodmother down because Shell's Angel spent a particularly long amount of time. Nonetheless, they have pulled Cordana Felsong, the last boss of the dungeon and really of uh, actually this entire E regional right now. Three phases to this boss. First one we're entering here, or rather the second one we're entering here with the shadow spawning. You do have to kill this Avatar Shadow in order to respawn the light and get Cordana out of the shadows, resuming her first phase abilities. And then, Jack, we do, of course, know at 40%, she will go immune for 40 seconds spawning four walls yep, and uh, very important with the walls they will be coming uh, you know they will be spawning you know, one wall every about 10 or 15 seconds that will have only one gap available to them so it's very key to make sure that you're bringing the light and you're having the positioning uh, not necessarily running towards that gap the second that you see it but uh, trying to position yourself that you you'll be able to pass through the two gaps at the exact same time and then once once wall once one wall is almost complete is almost reached the other edge you know you will see another one actually spawning at that point so it's very important to watch the positioning and always follow Following your flashlight. Dural doing really well there.
there to kind of carry the light around and making sure to get rid of those void zones on the ground. Those do spread at a, a pretty rapid pace if you don't keep them babysat. Now, she does spawn two in opposite corners and then all of his and then swaps it up with spawning two near players. So if they were to actually tank Cortana near one of the corners, they could perhaps get a three for one combo kind of thing. Nonetheless, nothing too hard for them to deal with. Cortana does go to her immunity phase and they are well finding the gaps to these first walls as we have this excellent overhead view from our observers. Yep, and you're able to see here they're just moving towards that location where they'll be able to get everything in together. They'll be able to intercept together. Like I said, it's so important to make sure you're following the light uh, at this point, keeping everybody together because even if you're going to be running ahead, at this point they could just kind of stand still uh, and just wait for, of course, the duration of Cordana's shield to run out here. They're also going to be moving up towards that top left corner there, Shells Angels, because that will be the first location that uh, Cordana will move to. She will then have one ad that will put a shield on her that needs to be stunned to be able to in interrupt the shielding effect, and then they'll be able to burn the boss and follow up with the usual mechanics again. So Team Pogchamp just now entering their shadow phase, hoping to nuke as much damage down as they can. They do have that extra 40 seconds to make up for the rest of the boss. It's going to be a really daunting task for them. Shells Angels getting to 20% on Cordana right now, doing well to dodge that glaive. Tank having his back towards the platform. Certainly don't want to get punted off at the very end here, but Shell is looking to close out this match, and afterwards we'll have a 40 second countdown timer on Team Pogchamp to finish the match, but I actually don't think it'll be possible because the transition phase itself is actually 40 seconds, so it looks like t uh, sh uh, Shell's Angels is looking to clean this up. And we've seen Shell's Angels taking down Cordana right at, and we still have a little bit of time before Pogchamp is even able to actually spawn that transition phase that will be taking so much longer here. So at this point, they are a little bit too far off to be able to complete with this, and it does look like Team Shell's Angels has taken it. Yeah, it's 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 just not going to happen, unfortunately, at this point. Not only have they not even reached the transition, but the transition itself is already the amount of time that they had left over in order to even complete this boss. So it looks like we are crowning a winner here in Shell's Angels as they take the series 2-1. to one. Mr. Campbell. And that is the map that we kind of thought that they would do it on. Maybe not as clean as we've seen them do it in the past, but the real thing is, is both of these teams have their eye on one thing, and that is going to be their competition globally when they actually get to the first LAN in MDI history. Really excited to, to see that happen as well and see what it actually does look like for these squads. It's going to be a whole different style of tournament, actually getting up on the main stage, seeing your competition, and obviously it's going to play out a little bit different there. But congratulations to both of these squads. They were the powerhouse teams, you know, when we saw them play against each other first, and neither of them had lost a single series, and now they only each lost a series to each other. So major congratulations to PogChamp and Shells Angels. But starting with you, Jack, how do you think these guys will fare? We know quite a few of the teams that are already going. We're about at our halfway point of knowing which teams are going to make it to those global finals, because when we actually do touch down next week, we're going to figure out NA, and we have a little bit of a bonus round. We're going to figure out who from APAC is going on that Saturday. On Saturday, after we do six of the NA matches, instead of doing eight, we're going to do six that first day. And then we are going to actually do three of the matches for that APAC region to sort that out, to figure out who is going from that region. But globally, looking at Team PogChamp and Shells Angels, how do you think they will fare against the rest of the world? I think at this point when they're making it out of both of them making it out of the group stages very early on, I think it's a lot of validation coming to both teams and they're saying we had the right idea practicing for these strategies. We were winning our early games. We were blowing past the other teams here. And we've seen, like I said, we've seen about half of the region so far, maybe a little bit more of APAC uh, already. But I think at this point it will kind of reinforce that they need, you know, even when they're not going to be practicing as much for some of the more rare dungeons down the path, they want to really focus on whatever the dungeons will be in the group stages. They really have to have at least some sort of strategies because it really showed when they didn't have any plans really for Cathedral they played it kind of how you normally would on live servers they really just got completely obliterated there so you never want to be that vulnerable to your opponent's counter pick yeah important to pick, point out too we're probably not at the halfway part point we're probably at like five eighths through at this point uh, I, I actually did math there but let's take a look at the bracket right now salute because Jack brought up an important point he said hey look they probably feel pretty validated look at these teams that Shells Angels and PogChamp actually had to take out to, to be able to get to this place. Yeah, I mean, really impressive performance from uh, honestly, not just these two teams, but almost overall, all of the EU teams, all of the EU teams, really, not not almost, but everyone performed really well, and it was just by far the toughest bracket that we've seen so far, but one thing we have seen, of course, is that I mean, all these teams are, you know, only human. They they had their faults on some of the maps. They managed to get some wipes in. We saw some, you know, not so great performances in some of the C 
Speed area. We saw that wipe here, even from our champions at the moment in the EU region, wiping in the dungeon that before this they just showed how spectacular they were, but even they had their own slip ups at the beginning of the dungeon. So it's really, it's looking like it's going to be a great global with some of the best teams from each region coming out. But so far, in terms of the overall eight team wide performance for the region, I mean, EU was just, it was crazy. EU was actually insane. I, I think that we all knew that. It